Right. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this conference. Um, it's been some very interesting talks so far, and I'm going to try to pick up on some of the uh, themes that have come up in others. In particular, I'm hopefully going to give a slightly provocative talk about privacy, uh, following on from Jeffrey's talk earlier today. Um, so I come from the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. My background is philosophy. Um, I will touch on law a little bit today, but I'm hoping that the theory that I'm describing is something that can be an, an idea that can be picked up and ran with in the legal uh, realm because I'm certainly not the one with the, uh, the expertise to do so. Um, I should say that if you look at the paper, there are a number of theoretical issues that I simply don't have time to cover in the talk. Um, and I'll mention a couple of them as I go along, but you'll have to forgive me for glossing over some of the sort of finer theoretical and philosophical points um, of the idea that I'm presenting. So my, my aim today is to do two things. Uh, the first is to show how indiv individualistic theories of privacy insufficiently protect individuals against the invasive effects of big data analytics that involve classification or profiling of people. And so I'm proposing group privacy as a third type of interest to balance alongside individual privacy interests and the sort of social goods of data processing in general. And I'll talk a bit about biomedical uh, big data processing in particular. And so I'm making the, the argument based on the observation that personal data is interesting in big data analytics only insofar as it allows the individual to be located within a broader group or as part of a broader phenomenon through the identification of small patterns within the data set or connections between the people described in the data. Um, privacy theory and law must respond to the emerges, emerging capacities to learn about individuals through knowledge about the groups that they are allocated. So the work that I'm describing is following on from a paper uh, that, that came out last year where it was a review of, of sort of ethical issues with big data in general. And one of the things that we noted was that there was a, a real lack of discussion of harms and problems at the group level, um, and in particular related to privacy, as, as you can probably guess. There's also some practical relevance uh, to the idea that I'm describing, and that has to do with the, the general data protection regulation that will come into effect um, in two years, and the, the protections that it offers to data subjects um, in, in relation to automated decision making. And there, I can talk about those a bit more in the Q&A, but basically there are some very, very problematic rights that have to do with oversight um, that are granted to data subjects that have actually been around since the data protection directive but haven't been put into practice um, as far as I'm aware, possibly because the relevance of them wasn't clear at the time. But I think yeah, it will be very relevant now. So to clarify the, the terminology a little bit, I'm talking about three different types of groups. In particular, I'm talking about group privacy in relation to ad hoc groups. So you have collectives, and collectives are the types of groups that have uh, already been protected um, in the past when in, in work on group privacy. So things like patient advocacy groups, labor unions, groups that you join on purpose, groups that you join because you have a collective interest or a collective identity of some, some sort. You also have ascriptive groups, which would be a group whose membership is determined by inherited or incidentally developed characteristics. So genetics groups, patient co cohorts would be uh, the example there. So the type of group that I'm talking about is a group whose membership is assembled for a third party interest according to perceived links between the members. So this is a group where the members are typically not going to be aware that they are in fact a group at all. And so there's a relation here um, with prior work done on, on profiling. Um, and I sort of interchange between the language of big data analytics and profiling and algorithmic classification. Uh, so forgive me if there's, there's a bit of conceptual muddle on that end of things. So as I think some of the other talks have established quite well already, US and EU privacy law tends to protect identifiable individuals. Um, one is not a person in terms of the, in, in the eyes of the law in the absence of identifiability. In other words, you can do a lot more with anonymized data and pseudonymized pseudonym, data than you can do with identifiable data. Um, <clears throat> 
The problem is that the focus on identifiable individuals doesn't address new opportunities for privacy violations arising from big data analytics. So groups just, for instance, can suffer discrimination or preferential treatment driven by analytics without the members of the group ever being identified. There are some precedents already for groups to be rights holders, and whether or not groups and this particular type of group can be a right holder is one of the issues I'm glossing over here. Uh, but there are some, some precedents for that, so rights that are attributed to collectives, national sovereignty, the right to assemble for labor unions, for example. And the point that I want to bring up there is that the requirements to be a right rights holder in those contexts are typically some sort of collective identity and collective agency. And ad hoc groups will clearly lack both of those things, but they can nevertheless be considered moral patients and therefore potentially uh, deserving of, of, uh, of rights, or at least of interest at a minimum. And so profiling I'm seeing as an act of essentially creating new groups to help in some sort of decision making, typically uh, by an algorithmic system or an, or an algorithm. <coughs> so the, if, if profiling is about constructing groups, it's typically groups being constructed from anonymized data. Or at least you don't need identifiable data to, do, to construct the sorts of groups that I'm talking about. Personal data is required only when you place a person into these predefined groups. And again, this is glossing over the fact that you have sorts of clustering where the groups are uh, defined at the same time, that, you are, uh, that they're not necessarily pre-existing, but I'm going to leave that be for the moment. Um, so that's why personal data protections based on identifiability miss the mark. Um, connections are small patterns between individuals are of interest rather than the identifiable individual herself. Analytics algorithms form and manage ad hoc groups of individuals uh, perceived to be similar along one or more attributes. So individuals need not be identified, but rather classified to be made sense of. And so what we need, or the, the gap that I see, is that we need a theory of privacy that is relevant to these sorts of methods of sense making. Um, so it's not just relevant to the moment when Alice is put into a group, but rather the steps that led up to those groups being created. So within analytics, and we're using Alice as the, as the example of the individual here, Alice's identity is shared with other data subjects. Um, that, that identity, that sort of profiling identity, consists of shared behavioral tokens. So ad hoc groups are going to be defined by identity tokens that are not reducible to or owned by any individual member of the group. The tokens are non-random behaviors and attributes that allow data subjects to be meaningfully grouped. And this is at the basis of any sort of analytics. So just to, just to clarify what I mean by that a little bit, and forgive me if these, if these uh, diagrams are a bit simplistic. But essentially what you have is a, what I'm calling an identity constituting uh, information exchange between the person and the ad hoc group or the, the data processor assembling the ad hoc group. And so the person is contributing <clears throat> some sort of data about herself, behavioral attribute data, data collected by an IoT device, for example. And getting back from the, from the processor will be these behavioral identity tokens. These are essentially what, the, what attributes the processor found interesting, what sort of inferences the processor is making about the person to generate some sort of meaning about them. Now what I'm pointing out here is that a person is not just going to have a, a single ad hoc group. There's going to be many of these information exchanges going on simultaneously and, <clears throat> and in parallel. And furthermore, um, these groups will not just be assembled from a single person, obviously. There will be many, many people involved in, <clears throat> in, the, or, yeah, involved in the construction of the groups. There will be many, many members. So to go back to Alice, <clears throat> what this means is that the group has an identity it's not reducible to the identities of, <clears throat> of individual members, uh, similar to some shared offline identifiers. So things like culture, <clears throat> sorry, could I have my drink from over there? Thank you. So s similar to things like uh, culture, ethnicity, uh, postal code, ownership of the, the identity tokens is distrib distributed across the members of the group. Thank you. Go for president. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> so the, uh, 
the behaviors that change how the group is understood or the predictions being made about the group affect uh, all of the members, including members of the group that have not yet been observed. So people that are potential members of the group that match the profile but have, haven't actually been uh, processed uh, quite yet. So as a result, the, the interesting implication of this is that the group as a whole has a claim to the tokens that are used to define it, that make up its identity and guide future actions taken towards it. The implication is that individual members do not retain an exclusive claim to the data trails that they generate once they have been algorithmically grouped. If there is a shared sense of identity, there has to be some sort of claim from the other group members to the things that make up that group, to, that make up that group's identity. So what I'm describing is group privacy as the right to uh, enveal a personality. I'm considering the privacy of the information that constitutes identity. <clears throat> um, a violation of informational privacy disrespects an individual or, group, or a group's claim over information about itself. <clears throat> so an ad hoc group's identity is going to consist of the classifications, the rules that are constructed by the algorithmic classification system, in other words, why you are a member of this particular group, along with the pr predictions made about that group and the inferences uh, about that group. And so this, this theory is, is, is based within um, Luciano Floridi's broader philosophy of information, specifically uses the concept of informational identity. And <clears throat> this idea of uh, inviolate personality, what that means is that it's essentially a right to immunity from unknown, undesired, or unintentional changes in one, one's own identity. And that comes from Warren and Brandeis. Um, and what's interesting is that this is actually an absolute right in principle that would require bargaining, um, ideally explicit bargaining, to be violated. Um, so under, you know, with that definition, that means any sort of data processing can be considered an attack on identity. Now obviously, taking in isolation, that is an absolutely wild claim um, that you are assaulting my identity if you're processing any data about me. But the point here is that is rather it's intended as a lever to start that bargaining process. It's to show that the that the um, that the group has a valid claim over the sort of identity that's being externally constructed, um, even if that is actually a very weak claim. So. I, I mean, there are many different potential ways to take this right. You can have three sort of general approaches to it. A strong sort of claim would mean that as a group, you can make a valid claim to the processes that are constituting your identity. So literally, you can make a valid claim against data processors. Um, a weak claim would be just that you have a right to be educated about how to use your data in a better way, in a more privacy, um, I don't know, in uh, privacy enhancing way. And a moderate claim would be that you have a right to oversight. So in other words, in some way, members of the group or whether the, whether the holder of the right is individuals or the group itself has a claim to be kept in the loop by data processors, by the people that are constructing this identity. Now in terms of actually implementing a right to group privacy, it would be uh, very, very difficult to say the least. And as you can tell, this is very much a theory at this point. I have, I'm not attempting to work out the legal ramifications of this. Um, I'm hoping that there'll be many, many points about why this is a crazy idea and will not work. But hey, if, it, if I don't get that, then I don't think it's a good theory. Um, so it, I'll sort of leave you to, to read about this in the paper, just um, in, in interest of time. But essentially, you can have two different, two general approaches to actual protections of group privacy, proactive ones where you prohibit certain types of profiling and reactive ones where you try to redress the, the more harmful uh, effects of profiling. And the real challenge is that big data produces these sorts of identities as a matter of course, that this is something that is uh, very prolific, that's very widespread. And to get quickly to group privacy and biomedical big data, I think that it's applicable in, in principle to any sort of analytics. I think it is much less relevant to biomedical big data research uh, just because of the social contract you already have that uh, governs uh, data sharing. But it could be very relevant to commercial forms of big data analytics like hiring practices, wellness monitoring, health insurance, and so forth. And it could be used as a lever in that context to address the information asymmetry between data subjects and commercial processors. It could also have relevance to digital epidemiology, where you have a lack of an implicit social contract for repurposing something like tweets to do health research on that.
and could also be used as a theoretical framework for consent reforms, the various consent reforms that we've seen proposed. And so finally, these are some of the open questions that we still have to answer with group privacy. Um, I think the most interesting, interesting one is what new types of vulnerable groups will big data analytics create and which new attributes or classes will require protection beyond you know, what's already classified in anti-discrimination. And I will, in the interest of time, seeing as my time is up, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you.